Uh, Josh, yes, you are the lead faculty for the South Campus. You've Correct. worked in the field. Yes. Uh, tell me a little bit about, if you don't mind, just tell me a little bit about what your background is, how you got into WIND. Uh, the reason I got into WIND was from PCI. Okay. I was a, uh, I was a grad from uh, the program. Okay. Basically, uh, PCI helped me get into the industry. Great. And uh, ever since then, it's just been hard work and showing up on time and correctly filling out paperwork. And uh, before I knew it, I was a team lead. Before I knew it, I was being offered an instruction position. Fantastic. Where did you work at? I've worked for a company called System One, which okay. is a third-party contractor. I've also worked for a company called PEM, or Power Equipment Maintenance. Okay. And they do a lot of industrial third-party contracting. Wonderful, wonderful. So you've been around the country? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Where have you been? Iowa, Colorado, California, Oklahoma, Texas a lot, um, western Kansas, a uh, couple sites in Nebraska, and the list goes on. Great, that's awesome. And how long were you in the field for? Uh, about three years. Three a little years. under three years. A little under three years. That is fantastic. So uh, the goal of what we're trying to do here is why I brought you in to talk to you a little bit is I really just want to, we have some new graduates um, that are always, you know, have some questions that tend to come up. and. I think sometimes hearing it from somebody who's done it and has been in the field is a little bit easier than me trying to tell people what's going on. First job out of school, what what kind of work, um, you know, could they be expected to do? What kind of work did you do? Different things like that. Ninety percent of the time, the new guy that starts with the crew will either start with uh, basic cleaning, basic, very basic maintenances. Okay. Um, for the most part, you're going to be torquing and tensioning, which is basically just tightening bolts. Yep. Um, once the crew you're working with feels more and more comfortable with you and trusts you a little bit more, then you'll get bumped up to more of the service side of things where you're changing filters and pumping grease and uh, getting oil samples and things along those lines. Uh, once you feel or once your crew feels more comfortable with you and your company's starting to trust you a lot more, then they bump you into a uh, different projects okay. or into a troubleshoot lead. Or the more you learn the tower, the faster you you basically get bumped up. Great, great, great. Now you mentioned you worked for System One and PEM. Those are both third party contractors. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what kind of companies? I mean, I'm a, I'm a brand new graduate. What, what type of companies should I be looking at? Are there any, you know, any specific companies that you really, you know, that you know a lot about that you feel like people should be applying to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say the, the first step would be to apply with your third party contractors. Those guys, they tend to um, they tend to hire you in uh, knowing you've been to school and they'll, uh, they'll give you the chance or the, uh, the foot in the door, so okay. to speak. Uh, it's usually a lot easier to get hired on with a third party instead of a, a tower manufacturer. Okay. And again, the industry is all about trust. So once, once your company trusts you with this, then you start to get more experience and more experience can lead you into better high paying jobs. Okay. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I'm a new graduate, I'm, I'm wanna know why, why isn't GE or Siemens calling me? I'm, I'm, I'm applying all the time, but I don't understand why they're not calling me back. Uh, GE, uh, Siemens, Festus, these big name companies, um, it's very, very expensive to hire an, an, an experienced technician. So usually what happens is, is a technician will get hired onto GE or Siemens or Festus from a subcontractor or, or one of the third party subcontractors, basically because they have experience. So if you don't have experience, it's kind of hard to get the job. Okay. So that's why there's always a third-party contractor that's a good middleman. Okay. So then that way your subcontractor trains you up, they give you the experience, and then once you're fully trusted and you are qualified and you are capable of doing the job, that's when you get shifted over into a, uh, a Siemens or a GE or a Vestas position. Okay. So that's like when I'm seeing online and... You know, I'll look at the GE and it says entry level, but then it's asking for a year or two of experience. It's not really entry level. It's like entry level for them, but it's like you yeah. still need to be at a little bit of experience in the field is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. When you see postings like that, it's usually for experienced entry level positions. Okay. Um, just leaving PCI, you are zero experience. Right. You have the knowledge, you just don't have the experience. Perfect. So every tower you climb is a, another tower of experience on your resume. Awesome. Great. So... All right, I'm out in the field. I got hired by a third-party contractor. What, what, what am I looking at? What, what kind of hours am I looking at? Every site's different. Every company's different. Every, every tower is going to be a little bit differently. 
So it really depends on the job you're working at. Okay. Anywhere from 40 to 50 hours a week is very average. Okay. Although there are going to be times where there is a deadline and you have to get the job done, in which case you could be working anywhere from 60 to 70 hours a week. Okay. But then again, it always depends on the company and different policies and different company uh, rules and things like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Do you see there's like a peak time? Is there like when when there's more work available? What do you see in that? Oh, absolutely. Um, we all know it's easier to work in the summer than it is to in the winter. Okay. So all of these third-party contractors, they usually start hiring in the spring, um, starting to revamp for the summer. Okay. Usually the summertime or when it's nice out, it's you know the peak season, and then towards the winter time, it starts to slow down. Contracts stop. Um, Generally, it's just not safe to work when it's icy or snowing and things along those lines. So these companies know that, and what they do is they, they just plan on having a slower time of the month, okay. a slower time of the year. Perfect. Great. Um, big question always gets asked, uh, how, much, how much should I expect to get paid? Uh, pay expectations. It all depends on past experience. It all depends on basically how well you looked coming from PCI. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you what, if you have perfect attendance and you have a 4.0 GPA, you're probably going to get paid a little bit more than somebody who barely got by the program or barely got through the program. Okay. But then again, every company has their own starting wage. Um, and with that being said, every company has a different starting wage for the experience that you have or the experience that you are, uh, or that's on your resume. Okay, great. Um, so is there, so are you telling me like, I'm probably not going to make six figures walking out the door? Probably not going to make six figures. Um, you make good money. Okay. Don't get me wrong, but you're not going to make a million dollars, you know, overnight. You know, okay. it's. These are these are livable wages, and they are they are definitely higher wages than what you would see basically if you were just an average technician. Okay. Um, but it all just depends on experience and how fast you pick up these things, and the more trust your company gives you or believes in you, and of course you get bumped up on the pay scale yeah. accordingly. Absolutely. Now you mentioned earlier you have seen a lot of the country. Yep. I think that's a pretty. I think I feel like you've seen quite a bit of the country. Yeah. So I'm an, I'm new. Uh, I, am I gonna be? What, do I have to travel? What, I mean, what, do I have? Am I, I really want to. I really want to work stationary. I just want to go ahead. I want to relocate right now. Um, I want to go ahead and just move out to Texas. Uh, what, are, what are my odds? It just depends on the job you apply for. Um, the industry is definitely split into two two sections. You have your travelers and you have your relocation jobs. Um, it just depends on what your company wants for you. So it's easier to get a traveling position because then you don't have to be in one central location. Right. But then again, if you have family and you have wife and kids and everything like that, you need to be stationary. Uh, but there are also companies out there that pay for relocation mm -hmm. and uh, help you get settled into that new site, in which case you would be just working strictly out of that site. Now, do you see within those third-party contractors, the one we were talking about earlier that you were with, um, and just in general with third-party contractors, do you see that most of those jobs tend to be travel? Because you mentioned that those are a lot of where the jobs, especially coming out of school, that's where people really should be looking. Do those tend to be more travel gigs, or do those tend to be more stationary? More. Uh, you are much more valuable to the company if you are a travel tech. Okay. Because that means you can, you can solve a problem and then go to a different site where they need the extra help. Okay. As to where if you're a stationary technician, you are just there. Right. So you're going to have a lot better luck getting a job as a travel te travel technician as opposed to a relocation gig. Okay, good. So I mean, basically, I just want to re-clarify that what you're saying is, is that really more than likely you need to be open to the idea of traveling, uh, coming out of school with the idea that moving forward that there is the possibility of a stationary gig and while it's not... The way you're not precluded from applying for those, you may have better more better luck, more success if you if you open yourself up and understand that there's you know the travel portion is going to be huge for somebody. Absolutely. Usually, usually what happens is is you get hired on as a travel tech. You travel for a year to two years or three years, and then from there you would find a site that you would like, and then you could potentially relocate to that site permanently. So I'm traveling. I took a traveling gig. So what I'd love for you to kind of tell me a little bit about what I can expect as a travel tech in terms of what my schedule might look like, 
uh, per diem, maybe not necessarily, you know, like, you know, maybe not numbers, but just what per diem is, um, kind of explain how that works for me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in addition to what your hourly wage is going to be, you will also get a per diem. Okay. Per diem is for expenses on the road. So your hotel room, okay. food, things along those lines. Um, uh, per diem is paid out seven days a week that you are on site working for the company. Of course, if you come back home, you're not going to get your per diem. Um, and along with that, um, travel is also paid for. Okay. So typically what happens is, is you're at home, you get the call, you figure out what site you're going to, you would fill out a offer letter and that would tell you what you're going to be making at that site okay. or if anything changes from your original pay. And then uh, what happens is the operations manager at the company would book you a flight, uh, let you know where you're going so you have plenty of time to get your hotel and uh, all that travel accommodations figured out. Uh, usually once you get flown out, uh, the company will have a rental car uh, waiting for you. Okay. Um, and then once you get your rental truck, then it's off to the hotel. Um, and then in the morning, usually you start work um, as soon as you travel out or the day after you travel out. So is it pretty, I mean, obviously every company is a little bit different, but is it pretty standard that they'll pay for your travel like to go from site to site? Um, I mean, are there, have you heard of instances where they don't always pay for that? There are instances where they won't cover your travel from uh, site to site, but it all just depends on where you are and where you're going. Okay. So, of course, if I were to take a job in Iowa, I'm probably not going to get a whole lot of travel assistance because it's only two or three hours down the road. Right. So from in that instance, I probably wouldn't get any travel. But if I were to go to Colorado or Texas or somewhere uh, a couple hundred miles away, okay. then they would, of course, they would pay for traveling along those lines. Awesome. I really appreciate you clarifying that. So... Uh, what's the schedule look like? I mean, how, I mean, what am I looking at in terms of how many weeks am I out of sight before I come home typically or what are your experience is? Absolutely. Uh, most companies have a six weeks working, a one week off schedule, which okay. is called your interim vacation or uh, R&R as some guys like to call it. Okay. Now, of course, that, that can be different from company to company. I've seen companies where it's four weeks on, one week off. Some companies are eight weeks on, one week off. It just depends on what the policy is. Um, and along with that, it all is, it just depends on what the project is that you're working on. Some companies don't offer a uh, time off and it's just project based, which means that you are there until the project is done. Okay. But with all that being said, it's, you're up to the com it's up to the company as far as uh, how often they're gonna let you take off and basically how important you are to getting that job done. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, last last little bit, and it just kind of hit me while you were talking about that, is within the, you know, we mentioned earlier about the peak seasons and different stuff like that. How would you suggest somebody, let's say that you are working for a third-party contractor who maybe not have a lot of work during the winter months, Do you, how, how would you, would you suggest that during that time you know, while you are working a lot of hours, how do you how do you suggest somebody prepare for those winter months when maybe the work's not nearly as? Because uh, I think that's you know a big a big concern is you may be out of work for two to three months. How's somebody supposed to live? What like do you have any tips or suggestions or what kind of how you did it? Absolutely. So and of course with being in the wind industry, you know that when the job's done, it you might have to be sitting at home for a couple of weeks, uh, possibly a month before you get sent out on another job. So you always need to have a little saved up and a little safety net okay. uh, set up for you, um, especially going into the winter months where things get slow, things uh, icy conditions can be dangerous. So mm -hmm. I try not to have you guys work as much. So I would say definitely plan on having uh, anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple months off during the slow times. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, is there anything else that you can think of that you know maybe want to kind of mention within the job you know within what the jobs look like different stuff like that things that maybe you know you you, you know you worked for three years you moved up quite a bit um, do you have any strategies maybe on on what that looks like yeah absolutely and I mean this advice can translate over to anything you show up on time you work hard and you fill out your paperwork right paperwork is 90% of a technician's job of course, if you're doing maintenances, you need to log everything that you're doing. If you're troubleshooting, you need to make sure you're logging all of the steps that you're taking in order to correct that issue. So that way, technicians in the future don't have to spend all that time troubleshooting it. Um, and along with that, it's 
you know, you have, you're kind of at the mercy of your company. Mm -hmm. So basically just stay flexible, work hard, get your paperwork in, and absorb all the information that you can. Great. I appreciate it. Well, Josh, I want to thank you so much for your time. And other than that, man, uh, get back to class and start teaching some more. Absolutely. All right. Have a good one, man. Thank you so much.